Welcome to the current federal tax developments for the week of July the 1st, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you as always by Capital Professional Education and by your State Society of CPAs. This week we have a few things to look at here in tax developments. We're going to talk about an email the IRS sent out to all tax practitioners regarding what to do if you have a data breach in your firm. We have a comments from an IRS official that give us some guidance on when we might be able to treat a commercial and residential rental as one trader business. We also have the tax court which couldn't buy a taxpayer's logs on his auto mileage when one of the problems with his logs was he claims to have driven from Florida to South Africa. Might be a reason why it doesn't get too much in the way of credibility when you do something like that. And finally the Ninth Circuit this week ruled on a case where the question of whether a transaction was substantially similar to a listed transaction came into play, the Ninth Circuit found that in this case, as the District Court had found, the transaction was substantially similar to a listed transaction, and therefore the taxpayer was subject to a penalty. Well, I'm recording this a little bit late this week, because we just got back, I just got back, uh, from being on the road. I did a session in Tucson on Wednesday morning, and then I had to fly out to Portland and because of the time involved it was easier to fly to Portland from Tucson so I ended up being flying from Tucson to Portland which was great except getting back to Tucson I, which I needed to do because my car was sitting there uh, took a little bit of more work because I had to fly out Saturday morning then drive to Phoenix so that's why this week we're doing it here on I'm actually recording on Sunday not Saturday like normal so We'll solve it up by Monday, as it always is, but we'll go ahead and, as I said, it's a little bit late. If you're used to picking up on the weekends, that's why we're a little bit late this week. I will be going to Albuquerque, New Mexico later this month, and in Albuquerque, we'll be doing a pair of courses there. Coming up on the 22nd and 23rd, we'll be doing courses on the 22nd, Construction Contractors, Specialized Tax and Accounting Issues, and on the 23rd, Advanced Partnership Issues, including the new Partnership Audit Rules. Those both will be at the New Mexico Society of CPAs offices in Albuquerque. If you're interested in attending those courses, you can check them out on the New Mexico Society of CPAs website at nmscpa.org. And you can check there, go to the CP uh, links on the website, and you'll find the links for those upcoming courses. We also have four ANA courses being offered by Kaplan this month in Albuquerque, so if you're interested in those, you can pick those courses up as well. Actually, I think it's five courses because one day is two four-hour courses. We have those courses coming up as well, so you might take a look there on what's coming up both on the tax side and on the accounting and auditing side. Let's go ahead and talk about this week's cases, or actually developments, and the first one isn't really a development, it's an email the IRS sent out. And the email article had the title, Data Breach, exclamation point, contact the IRS, another exclamation point. I uh, guess I want to emphasize this is important. It's from the IRS's Return Preparer Office. The electronic mail was sent out on the 24th of June. This electronic mail was an email to tax preparers outlining the steps the preparer should take if a data breach occurs. The IRS has been concerned recently that a lot of problems are developing in the preparer's offices now. Remember, the initial tax we're trying to get into the IRS systems in order to, or not systems, but in essence, in essence being able to just play game the system to be able to file fraudulent electronic returns. The IRS has gotten better at basically spotting accounts that are set up solely to file fraudulent returns. So now we're moving to the other side of this equation where people are setting up accounts or trying to take over preparer systems in order to file from there. That makes it tougher for the service to discover that the, this isn't legitimate because the returns are coming from where they came the prior year. They're coming from a preparer who hasn't had issues with this before. And while eventually it gets noticed, it's a bit of a problem. Also, let's be totally honest, the stuff we're sitting on in our offices is very, very, very sensitive information. That information is something that could be useful for purposes other than just filing a false tax return. So for that reason, there's a high level of concern about what happens if you get if your data breach occurs. Now, one of the catches is they tell you here the places you should contact. And it's divided into three categories to contact the IRS and law enforcement, to contact the states in which you prepare returns, 
and to contact experts, or I should say, and then fourth, to contact the clients and other services that are involved. On the IRS side, they tell you to report client data theft to the shareholder liaison in your local office. The liaison will notify the IRS Criminal Investigation Divisions and others on your behalf. Uh, you also have to report the FBI, your local office, if you're directed to by the IRS. The Secret Service, if directed by the IRS. And then finally, the lo local police to file a report on the data breach. Now, they do remind you of one little detail. At this point in time, as I recall, we got the last two states finally passing one of these. I think it was finally last year the final state came in. A breach of personal information is going to be normally a violation of state law. And there are requirements that if information is breached, you have to report that data in some way, shape, or form. Generally, you have to contact the Attorney General for the state in question to report there's been a breach or certain other, state, other steps you have to take. These are all things that you need to be aware of. You know, now, to be totally honest, all of this should be done in consultation with counsel because this is a major legal exposure for the firm. And you don't want to be going out there and doing this on your own unless you know that we've got, you know, backup and we know we're doing something that's been advised by legal counsel. Third, they say contact experts, a security expert, determine the cause and scope of the breach to stop the breach and prevent future breaches. There is a difference between a security expert and an IT consultant that's somewhat important. You have to understand security is not, you know, every IT expert is not necessarily a security expert. IT people have been driven primarily, they want to keep systems up and running. That is part of security, but that's not all of security, keeping them up and running, you know, because, hey, the guys want to file false returns, they want to keep your systems up and running too, so that's not going to be a problem. But the catch is the way you secure systems to try to make them more difficult for third parties to break into quite often runs counter to this idea that we want to keep systems up at all costs. And because of that, that creates a bit of a tension between what an IT person who may be driven primarily by, because that's what your contract with them talks about, is about keeping your systems up constantly versus trying to keep them secure. For instance, one of the key ways you need to have work to keep your system secure, especially today, is to make sure that all software is promptly updated when some sort of a problem is, you know, is become we become aware of a problem. You know, Microsoft pushes out patches. The catch is, of course, if you do that, at some point, I tell everybody, at some point, if you apply a patch from Microsoft, you're going to get a system that won't function anymore. And if that occurs on April the 12th, you're not going to be happy. And by the way, I hate to say it, but Microsoft's Patch Tuesday is the second Tuesday of the month, which means there is almost always a Patch Tuesday right in the final stretch of tax season. It's the way the IRS, is, it's the way the Microsoft has structured this thing. Can't, not much we can do about it. I doubt they're going to change it just for tax people. But it is a problem that we hit that patches at that point. The catch is once those patches are out, they are reverse engineered. And that means that the people that are trying to get in are looking at those, trying to figure out what did Microsoft do? Why did they make these changes? And once they figure out why they made the changes, they then figure out how to get into the old system. And once they do that, and this tends to happen within about 24 to 48 hours after the patches are made available to the public, then they start you know, starting attacks to go after systems that have not yet been patched. So there is a decreasing window when you can delay patches for testing and not have basically severely compromised the security of your systems. IT people will not want to patch it because the chances of going down go way up every time we put these patches in. In fact, recently Microsoft's had real problems with these patches, bringing things down. But the flip side of that is, if somebody gets in your server, we're talking about a lot of money. I mean, we're talking about a lot of damage and a lot of money, damage to your reputation and just a lot of money to recover from the problem. You're talking about, in some cases, depending upon the nature of what happens, you're talking about like an end of the firm type issue coming to light. So, you know, now you got that trade off between maybe bringing the server down or maybe exposing us to a disastrous breach. That's kind of a problem.
They also have the way to contact clients and other services, which includes the Federal Trade Commission, credit and ID theft protection agencies, and credit bureaus. You're probably going to have to buy credit protection for your all of your clients and potentially all of their employees. Anybody who had personal data on your server, it's not going to just be your clients because your clients per your clients may have personal data like of their employees. And if you've been doing audits of their financial statement, there's a real chance that you've got that personal data sitting on your server. And if somebody gets in, we end up kind of having to assume they got look at it. This is a real mess that we've got today. Right. That, you know, those notifications, of the attorney general, we're seeing more and more and more of these breaches. Just this week was published a breach that occurred that took nine years for a dental insurance organization. They had a breach that went on for nine years before anybody noticed it. We also had a breach reported this week of a company that was a, you know, basically helped you, you know, you bought Microsoft Office 365 licenses through them because it was a lot cheaper than paying directly to Microsoft. The problem is those partners generally retain the login information for your systems. They got an employee account at the, one of the larger one of those organizations. And suddenly we don't know, you know, you become one of those things where they technically had access to the logins for all of those systems. You know, if they got in, if they use those logins, then we have a potential big problem. So these are becoming a bigger and bigger issue. It's a problem. They will continue. They've been in the news continuously. Interestingly enough, we do have in the articles this week, we have an article there from Verizon's 2018 data breach investigation report that kind of talks about the things that where we tend to see these uh, breaches occur. And what they say is the most significant action varieties, I love that term, uh, whether we're security incidents in a company, Verizon does this every year. You know, they, they take a study of security incidents, they have a security, they basically one of the things they do, aside from cell phones and landlines, is they handle IT security issues. And they found, you know, they said, look, in the professional technical and scientific services industry, which is where we're going to sit, they, they said some of the biggest problems, the biggest problems in order they had First was the use of stolen credentials. That is, somehow the third party got the username and password to get into the system. To be totally honest, I expect in many cases that's because your employee or you have been reusing your username and password. So, you know, you have an e your email address is your username on so many places it's not funny. And, you know, that's just because they know you remember it, it's easier to do. But the problem is if you use that username and password, anywhere but for logging in to the crucial things regarding your firm. If you use the same password to, let's say, get into your cloud computing platform or your cloud you know, tax processing platform that you use to get into Facebook, use to get into Twitter, use to get into LinkedIn, use then maybe when you establish an account on Adobe, Use it when you establish an account because you have this high school reunion coming up and they have some sort of message board and they want you to get an account. So you've used the same username and password everywhere. If any of those have a breach where they lose control of the username and password, and most of them, you know, have had, and to be honest, a lot of those are now known to have exposed username and passwords in some way, shape, or form, or like in the case of LinkedIn. This goes back a number of years, but just had a major, major breach where all of those got released. Adobe had a major breach a few years ago. So if you have an account with Adobe, and many of us do, probably most of us do, because we're buying Acrobat, and that, that's how you get Acrobat in many cases, um, you know, those username and passwords are out there. There are websites, I believe one of the most famous is Have, have I Been Pwned? Uh, where you can where you can give it the email address and they can tell you if your email address shows up on any of these breach lists. Um, and if you've been you were using passwords and your your email shows up on that have I been pwned and you can actually have Firefox automatically check that for you. You know they'll they'll give you warnings. Uh, if you're not using a different password on every site, you got you got huge problems. Probably somebody can just log in and file returns with no particular work for you. Uh, certainly suggest everybody should be using two-factor authentication. I would strongly suggest if you really think you're, if you're high target value enough, and you may be as a CPA firm, uh, do not use SMS messaging on the phone unless you have no other option. 
the reason why. There actually was a good article this week. I believe it was in Gadget. But they, they wrote up a couple of SMS hijacking options. The problem is it's not that difficult for me to go down to the cell phone company and convince them that, oh, I lost the phone. I don't know what it is. If I have a little bit of personal data about you, just general personal information about you, I can get a SIM card, take over your phone, essentially take over your phone number. And again, then it, to you, it's just like, well, my phone's not working. I'll just have to get a hold of T-Mobile. I'm going to say T-Mobile because they've been to blame in some of the biggest ones that we've been reported, some of the most high profile. So I'm going to blame them because, hey, you know, they're, they're a known problem in this area or have been reported consistently to be a known problem. Um, you know, and then they call down and say, hey, I need the new phone. I lost this. And suddenly, well, my phone's not working. I'll call T-Mobile in the morning. Well, by the time you call them in the morning, all of your accounts may have been compromised because they were able to get in. They have the two-factor as long as they have your password and they now have that SIM card. They're able to get in and do what they want to do. That's why I would strongly suggest you don't use that for two-factor. If offered, I strongly suggest you use the third-party application methods, uh, authenticator apps like Google Authenticator or the similar apps of that sort. I think Thomson Reuters for their systems has their own authenticator app that basically does the same thing. I've been half convinced it really is it is the same Google Authenticator type calculation, but you know, they got to put their name on it. Uh, there are also some like Microsoft has their system that can either use an authenticator number or can contact you. But if you do that, be very careful. Many times you're going to want you to give a secondary way to get in your account in case you somehow lost the authenticator or lost control of it. Uh, if you put SMS in there, then, yeah, you're still open. Whatever the secondary method is, if the bad guys can have enough to get that to work, then it doesn't matter what you're using for the first. So just be careful. The next biggest thing was phishing. Uh, makes perfect sense. They send a phishing email to your staff. They just enter in the username and password. That makes it easy to get in. They also talked about missed delivery, sending information to the wrong client. Yeah, that's a security problem, right? Uh, privilege abuse where an account, and this is often combined with the others, where let's say you're, you know, you just give everybody the same access to the server throughout your office and they compromise the account of your receptionist and suddenly they can get into every single tax return file. That's kind of a privilege problem. They shouldn't have any access there. Pretexting, uh, that's also often combined. What pretexting is, is normally not done electronically. It's done where somebody calls on the phone, etc. And given some pretext saying like, you know, oh, it's your utility company or whatever. I get personal data from your personal data. I can do the SIM card swap. Once I do the SIM card swap, I get around to factor on your account for using that. So, you know, just giving that information via other mechanisms takes into account that people now might believe, oh, computer stuff's dangerous, but they go that route. And finally, just simple misconfiguration. It's amazing as we're moving to the cloud, how many companies and some big ones have managed to move data onto cloud servers and neglected to have passwords on them. You know, just this week, a major a major IT outfit was discovered to have moved stuff to to Amazon Web Services. They had AWS buckets to hold data, which is fine. All the security can be there, but they oh by the way forgot to password protect the accounts. So anybody that just knew it was there could have looked at it, or anybody that looked to find it, and these can be found. So again, that is Verizon's 2018 data breach investigation report. Uh, page 38 of that report, you can download it for free from the web. That's the one that talks about the, you know, the issues for professional, technical, and scientific services. Next up, this has driven people. I've had more people talk to me about this than anything else. So I'm glad we finally had somebody from the IRS make a statement in this area. What, in this case, what Holly Porter said is exactly what I've been saying from day one. But at this point, we can say, yes, here's Holly Porter from the Office of Chief Counsel of the IRS at a public event stating specifically this can happen. The question becomes, can you combine commercial and residential rentals into one trader business? A lot of people were concerned about whether you could do that, whether they could be in the same trader business. And the reason why was because, you know, we have notice 2019 told us that, you know, we're going to put together these rental enterprises if you want to use the safe harbor. Again, my thought on the safe harbor is it's worthless outside the Second Circuit. But if you seriously want to use it, 
which again, I really don't know why you do, but if you do, then you're all worked up because it told you that enterprises cannot be both commercial and residential. Now I remind you, even if you really like that and you love the whole deal, the catch is that is merely a safe harbor. It does not say if you don't, if you can't meet all of its requirements, you don't have a trade or business. The IRS has on multiple occasions told us that, yeah, it was meant for the very simple situations. It's not meant to have handle a complex situation. So, yeah, don't try to make it handle a complex situation. J just accept what we've got. But then example 17 in regulation 1.199A-4, uh, for D, I should say, tells us, you know, it goes through, there we're talking about aggregation of already existing TOBs. Please remember, under the aggregation rules, unless the thing is already a trader business, that is, if we don't like to aggregate, it would still be a trader business, we can't aggregate it under those rules. So we have an existing trader business that is all commercial property, an existing trader business that is all residential property. We meet all of the requirements for having common control. It's not specified service trader business. But then we have to meet two of three criteria. Well, one of those criteria is it is of, you know, we're, you know the items re represent sale of the same product, service, or property. Property being what was added for rentals. And that example tells us that residential and commercial rentals are not the same property. Well, now again, that one doesn't say you couldn't have, you know, remember, go back a step, just create a TOB. Didn't say we couldn't have created a TOB with both in it. It also doesn't, you know, it doesn't even say we can't really aggregate them if we could meet the other two criteria. It's a little tough to meet those two, but I could conceive a situation where we might meet those two. But again, People then looked at those two and said, you know what, is that just implying that they never can be in the same trader business, which runs totally contrary to what the IRS tells us if you read the regulations on multiple trader businesses, which always gets me sorry. There they tell us an entity is just presumed to have one trader business, and it's really tough to have more than one. But apparently some people are reading the regs say, yeah, except the magic case where those trader businesses are rentals, then commercial and residential. I don't care how mixed up your books are. They're two trader businesses. Well, Holly Porter, who is today the Associate Chief Counsel, Irish Associate Chief Counsel, Pastor in Special Industries, stated at a New York University uh, forum that, yes, commercial and residential could be combined specifically. The question was asked, what if we had a property, which exists in a lot of downtown areas, where the ground floor is commercial? You know, there are bakeries, shops, restaurants, stores on the ground floor, and all the upper floors are residential. And I own that building. If I own that building, can I say I have one trader business as I lease out the lower floor commercially and the upper floor residentially? And Holly said, of course, that one makes sense. She also said, generally, you could combine the two if, based on the facts and circumstances, it appears they're one trader business. It's a fact and circumstances test. Nowhere does the IRS say you can't have them together. It's a judgment call. So in case you feel like you need the IRS to have told you this is okay, Eric Yach, in, when he reported in the article, mixed use property could be one business for 19, 199 cap A purposes, tax notes today on 628.19. That's where we quote Holly, Holly Porter who told us yes. They can be all in the same trader business. Okay, it's not a surprising answer. I've told people this for months, but I realize pe people get all worked up, and you know I'm gonna have a little trouble getting people to believe this. You can believe it now. It's okay to do it. What's not okay to do though was the case of Burden et al. versus Commissioner Tax Court Summary Opinion 2019-11. The opinion issued on June the 24th, 2019. Uh, Mr. Burden. In this case was he was a minister his wife was a flight attendant is the way it worked and they claimed a lot of business expenses including over twenty thousand dollars for vehicle expenses okay now remember under 274 D in order for a deduction for automobile expenses to be sustained in most cases right and he didn't qualify for any of the exceptions we need to have a record, contemporaneous record, of, ver of that contains items like business purpose, you know, the mileage, the time of the trip, you know, why we did it, amounts, all those things. 
So for practical purposes, all we know that would work for sure would be a mileage log of some sort would work. You can do them for part of the year, the various other rules to get there, but you need some sort of contemporaneous, that means prepared at the time, documentation. Now, Mr. Burden came under exam. Uh, of course, the catch being that Mr. Burden then was going to be asked to produce documentation to show that this mileage works. Well, first thing is he actually produced uh, what was essentially three logs. Well, here's the catch. He claimed standard mileage, uh, standard mileage on 39,989 miles. But he also had a log of mileage that showed 43,996 miles and then a, let's say, a calendar log. And then he had just a straight old mileage log that reflected 44,093. So he had three different numbers, what he claimed and then two other logs. Now, the two logs were close, but it had problems. For instance, the logs indicated that on certain dates he had taken trips to South Africa and the Dominican Republic. And on both, and on both times, the log showed he drove. Now, Unless he has a really unusual car, the likelihood that, that he could have driven to the Dominican Republic or South Africa from Florida, it, yeah, it doesn't work that way. You drive in the ocean, the car kind of sinks, and it doesn't really work. The car doesn't run. You destroy the car the first feet in. It does. It's not going to work. So the judge had trouble believing him in this case, right? They, they have major, major problems. That's not surprising. This may just qualify as the worst logs. Why do logs look like this? Well, a lot of times it's because the taxpayer is trying to put these things together once they get the exam notice. And when they do that, they stop thinking and they do dumb things like putting things in the log, driving from Florida to South Africa, right? There's another problem, though. There were some expenses that they had for travel. But there they couldn't show the travel expenses would not have been reimbursed by the employer. If you have a right to have expenses reimbursed, and he admitted that the employer did was did reimburse some travel expenses, but he had no evidence as to whether the expenses he'd incurred in traveling actually could have been reimbursed. Well, that's also fatal. Finally, he failed to be able to show that the travel to Dominican Republic and South Africa was primarily for business and not personal purposes. Yes, he did some things related to his business there. They related to his ministry. He, you know, he'd do a couple of services, have a couple of minor events. But the court noted that at the same time, he went to a lot of tourist destinations while he was there. And in South Africa, he did that. In Dominican Republic, his wife had relatives in Dominican Republic, and they spent time with the relatives. So he also couldn't show the primary purpose of the travel was for business. So even if he could have shown the employer wouldn't reimburse him, he probably couldn't have, he wouldn't have been able to get the deduction anyway. It was a disaster all around. Remember, the substantiation rules on 274D are absolute for these items. It's not just, to, you know, th this is not, you know, just kind of, kind of make it close. It works fine. This is, we need to have real substantiation to back this up. On 274D, the tax court always rules. If the substantiation does not exist in sufficient, to a sufficiently exact level, the deduction is zero. There is no question Mr. Burden had some travel expenses. There's no question he had some reasonable travel and, you know, driving expenses. But the reality was that we can't use the Cohen case, the old Cohen rule, to estimate those because Congress in 274D got rid of Cohen for certain items, and these are some of the items we got rid of it on. Be careful. Clients have to have documentation for these items. Next up, well, close doesn't count for the substantiation issue, right? But we found some place where close does count. Interior Glass Systems, Inc. versus United States. Ninth Circuit decision number 17-157-13, June 26, 2019, sustaining the decision of a U.S. District Court. Now, what happens in this case is we're looking at Section 6707, Cap A of the Internal Revenue Code. That section tells us that if we have a listed transaction, we are required to disclose on our return and every return on the return where we initially enter the transaction and every other return that is impacted by it, which can include carryback returns. If we had an annual carryback, we got to go do disclosure on those returns. We have to put disclosure on all those returns telling the IRS that we engage in a listed transaction. 
if you fail to disclose that, the penalty is equal to 75% of the tax benefit you received or you would have received had the program been legit based on what was reported on your original return. There is a minimum penalty of 5000 a maximum penalty of 200000 for an entity, 100000 if a natural person. So, for instance, if you invest in flaky employee benefit program, which is what they did here, you know, let's say in 2015, if you didn't report it, then you continue to be holding this stuff in 16, 17, 18, 19. Well, then you've got 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, five years. And potentially, if you're an entity, a million dollars worth of penalties. If you are a individual, oh, it's only a half million dollars worth of penalties. That might apply if that was more, you know, if essentially you got at least, we would we would do at that point, you know, like 133,000 worth of benefit each year. You could be sitting on a big, big penalty or 266,000 if an entity. Well, that was part of the problem we have with the interior glass. In this case, they had heard about, and they all, promoters always love to do this. They, they tried to promote an arrangement uh, where the taxpayer would essentially be buying life insurance. And they're going to try to use a trust or something. They're going to try to use the historical one the IRS identified, which was identified in Notice 2007-83, was when you had a trust or other fund described in 419E3. That, you know, so either that trust fund that's purported to be a welfare benefit fund, contributions to the fund were not governed by the terms of a collective bargaining agreement, the trust fund or other fund paid premiums on one or more cash value life insurance policies accumulated value, and the employer took a deduction that exceeded the sum of certain amounts. Now, in this case, they purchased a setup. They invested in a program, you know, put in here to buy the insurance. This did everything except instead of using the welfare benefit fund, it used a not-for-profit business league, but it accomplished the effectively the same result. The idea of these programs is I put all this money in for a welfare benefit program. I claim the life insurance is in there to fund that program. But then what I'm really doing is creating this big chunk of cash value life insurance that's only really going to benefit the owners. And if you want to really take it all the way, when you finally get to the back end when we're going to get rid of the program and we're going to distribute out these policies, that's a year when magically there is a huge, you know, charge for surrendering the policy that year that amazingly when you hold it one more year goes away so we do it naturally in a year when if it does come out the tax when it comes out assuming it's a taxable transaction to the employee and normally most of them at least admit that one theoretically is it's going to be way less than what was deducted and it's going to be way far less than the real underlying value of the policy well the IRS said, look, you guys, just throwing a business leak in instead of the trust, it's still substantially similar to 2783. And that's key because Congress, in passing this rule, specifically said that this penalty applied if you fail to disclose a listed transaction or one that is substantially similar. Now, the taxpayer claimed, oh, no, it's not similar because we used a business leak. The district court and the Ninth Circuit said, guys, that just isn't relevant. The reality is you're accomplishing exactly the same goal, and that's what we're looking for in this program, as you would have had to use the trust. The only reason you didn't use the trust was to try to skip by this on a technicality, and Congress specifically wrote this law saying we're not going to play this game that you know we're going to, that you can get around it by a technicality. Now remember. We're not saying at all yet that this program doesn't work, although, hint, it doesn't work. But what we are saying is, work or not, you have to have disclosed it. They didn't disclose it. So we're going to give up 75% of the tax benefits you've gotten. In this case, that would have been the deductions for the employer. And on top of that, which, by the way, is probably a separate return. This is going to get bad. Um, because they should have individually disclosed it because they're going to say what really was the owner's policy and, you know, he should have recognized that as income. We have all kinds of ways this kind of blows up for what the benefit was that we got. So, you know, kind of messy, messy problem, shall we say. So it gets very expensive. 
Um, the court said it works. Well, the taxpayer then said, well, oh, okay, but it's unconstitutional because it, it's vague. How in the world could a poor little taxpayer like me know that this was substantially similar? And the court kind of said, you're joking, right? They're saying, look, the only way Congress intended to control these scams, these scams are going to be attempting to skate the edges and try to find a technicality and then try to find some little technical detail to make changes. So I said, that's perfectly okay. Well, could a reasonable person understand, are you getting the same benefit they just talked about? The answer is yes. And the fact that the promoter and the attorney, the promoter arranged to tell you how wonderful it was, says it's different. You're not allowed to rely on that. That's not reasonable. You know, you should have gotten independent advice from somebody who you're going to pay regardless whether you did this or not. Um, you know, you should have figured out it was too good to be true. So, A, it's not impossible for you to have figured out that you should have had this. And basically, yeah, it's substantially similar enough. It's not unconstitutional. The, 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 this thing is basically fine. It's similar. That's all that counts. If you're substantially similar, you have to disclose on the 8886. Well, it's that time of year doing CPE. I just finished June. Of course, a lot of states have a June year end, so it was a you know, kind of messy month of June. Had a lot of courses I did. Some in states that have the end in June. Others just like in Arizona where that's just a good time to do it. So we're going to have fewer, a little bit less CPE for me to handle this month. I'll actually get to take some CPE on my own from other sources. So, you know, be able to get a little bit done that way. Uh, but you can go ahead and make sure you check your state society catalog for the CPE that is offered in your area. Especially in tax law today with all the changes we have happening, it's really, really important that you make sure you're getting current CPE. Not just CPE that may have been current three months ago when they put together the self-study program, but today, there's been developments since then that you just aren't aware of. You know, take a look at that. Find a real expert. Take the course. Their state societies offer you tons of options here with self-study or with live webcast that you can take. So take a look. Don't get left behind. Register now for 2019 CPE. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments. And again, you can catch our updates during the week on our website at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. You can send questions and comments to the email address edzollers at currentfrontaxdevelopments.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, the address I use on Twitter to post when things happen, at edzollers. I follow discussions on the subreddit, uh, slash r slash taxpros on Reddit. I also follow discussions on the Connect sites run by Arizona, New Jersey, and Minnesota. And I check into California's Tax Talk discussion group. Uh, that last one is open to any CPA in the country. Just go to Yahoo Groups and look, you know, search for Tax Talk and ask to get in. You'll be asked if you're a CPA or attorney and you know where you are and make sure you can do that. If you post, make sure that in your signature line at the bottom, you do put well, you know, that you're a CPA and you know your background, where you're from. That that helps there. It's a rule of the post of the post there. You'll be told you should do it if you don't, and nobody will answer you probably if you don't. So it's kind of important to do that. Uh, you know, check those sites. They're really, really useful sites, especially if you're a sole proprietor. You don't have somebody to run things off of. There's lots of useful information that crops up on those sites. With that, the Supreme Court has gone home for the year. We will talk about one Supreme Court issue next week that came up. Not a huge one. I'm going to hold it for next week, but we're going to talk about it briefly. Um, we also have the summer Congress, you know, has one more month to do something for the August recess. We'll keep an eye out whether they actually get to the Secure Act this month or they get to technical corrections. If they don't get to either one of those, we're going to basically be on hold for those until September. Those of you hoping to get a technical correction in time to do extended returns that have a due date in September, that wouldn't be a good thing because when they come back in September, they have like closing down the government problems. So, that probably means if they don't fix that in July, it's not getting fixed before the extended due dates. Um, so we'll keep you up on that stuff. What else happens this month? If you are going to be around for those New Mexico courses, be sure to take a look at them and sign up for them. Otherwise, take a look down the line. I'm going to be coming to a bunch of other states as we go through the rest of this year. I'm scheduled to go to South Dakota, Idaho. I'll be going to Washington. In the state of Washington, I'll be doing a set of programs there. Uh, in Washington, I'm going to do a set of programs 
that are related to uh, the tax conference they have in Washington every year. So I'll be appearing at that. I just found out about that this week. Looks like it may be doing some courses in Michigan this year as well. So we got dates coming up all over the place. Check your state study catalogs. Of course, doing courses here in Arizona. So I'll be around for that as well. And New Mexico, as I said. I'll come back there again later in the year. So our courses all over the place. Oh, yeah, I also do come back to New Jersey late later in the year too so we're all over the place we'll be seeing you wherever you are keep up with us watch the website and we'll watch for you here next week on current federal tax developments